Hello. Well, welcome everybody. Today we are talking about agile world building, which is a method of world building designed specifically for game masters by us over the last three years. We've taken, we've read extensively on world building, as you can probably imagine. So uh, we've taken a lot of principles from there and tried to make a methodology for world building that works for game masters. We'll be talking a little bit more about that, but probably we should introduce ourselves first. Well, hello, I'm Dimitris. I am a game master. I am the founder of World Danville and a big World Danville world, world building enthusiast and World Danville enthusiast, but world building mostly. <laughs> and I am Janet. I'm a writer. I'm a professional streamer and I'm also a game master. And I'm a recent game master, which means a lot of those first steps are still fresh in my mind. I remember how hard it was to get started. And uh, that's why we like to talk about agile world building because we think it's so important for game masters to get off on the right foot with world building Absolutely. and not see it as a giant pain in the bum but see it as an expression and a way to be really creative and get your players really engaged in your world without uh without succumbing to the dreaded world builders disease oh dear <laughs> so um let's just talk very quickly about why world building is so important um did you know that beowulf and Jaws, yes, that Jaws, are the same fundamental story. They are um, they're about overcoming a monster. That's the technical term for that kind of plot. A lot of the plot moments are the same. A lot of the uh, sort of main character attributes are the same. And what's different is the world building. That's what brings in the genre. It's what brings in the tone. It's what makes the world feel so different. It was, it's what makes it feel like a completely different book, a completely different movie. It's all about the world building, and that's where the magic can come from. It's not mechanic, it's creativity. So what's the problem with regular world building? Essentially, there are two methods that people favor. It's top down or it's bottom up. Now, top down world building, in a nutshell, is the world builder starts they start by thinking of a, a cosmology, so like a world mythos. How did the world come to be? They create some gods, they create some continents, they people those continents, uh, they create more and more details about that, then they create the settlements, then they create the religion, then they create the culture. It's a lot. And by that time, in fact, you have spent pretty much several months without having the ability to start playing or writing anything. Exactly. Spoiler alert, your players are now in a retirement home. You took too long. <laughs> <laughs> and I killed my husband. Um, the other method is bottom up. That's where you start with your players in a tavern, in a village, which is pretty much in isolation, and you don't give any other details. You don't necessarily know any other details. And that is the bottom up approach. You might know a little bit about the area around the village, but you don't know much more. So that's all fine. What's the problem with that? Well, top down world building, obviously, it takes you a lot of time. And it doesn't necessarily get you where you need to be, which is at the table playing. That's that's the important thing. You are a game master. The game is the thing, to quote Shakespeare. And uh, top down can really lead to railroading, which is kind of shoving your players in one direction because you made it. God damn it, they're going to go there. And there's nothing else to do as well. Right, that's a problem. Exactly. Yeah. So top down does have problems and bottom up has problems because bottom up often bottom up worlds can feel very generic. They lack the scope that makes your world interesting and they often lack focus as you move from one space to the next. They also suffer very often from what I call mosaic world building. Anyone who's played World of Warcraft, yes, I have played World of Warcraft, will know what I'm talking about. It's um, it's like you go into the hell area, and then you go into the fairy area, and then you go into the desert area. They all feel completely different. They all have boxes around them, and nothing feels contiguous. Nothing feels like it's part of the same world. So it feels really inauthentic, right? It feels kind of fake. And you don't want that. You want suspension of disbelief. So we've talked about why those don't work. What about agile world building? What, what is that? Why is that great? Well, this is, this is our idea of how to approach agile world, of how, sorry, how to approach world building as a game master. And it's taken from agile methodology that is used in coding and in all sorts of other practices. Essentially, it's a cycle of iterations that makes sure that you build only what you need, only when you need it, and most crucially, only to the depth that you, you need, need it. it. Right, exactly, because you know the you don't want to write the Silmarillion if all your players want to know is 
Lorien. Yeah, as exactly. Area, kind of all they want to know is one paragraph, but actually you wrote a book. And then you spent all that time reading a book, wrote, writing a book. They don't want to read the book. They want the one paragraph information that's going to get them on with the plot, right? And um, yeah, no, it's, it, it's really important to build what you need, to build when you need it, and to build that depth only what you need. And well, you it's certainly very important later. because you may you need to make sure that you do not build more than you need to start to play because as you just said very wisely, you want to be on the table, you want to be having fun because honestly, as you will find out very quickly, most of the creativity will come on the table. You can create a thousand things. Yeah. Trust me, when it comes to actually building amazing stuff, they will be during the time that you're playing. There are a lot of comments about elven shoes in the chat. If you're wondering <laughs> what that is, that is always my go-to example of um, building accidentally more than you need. So yeah. you build your elves, you write a paragraph about their clothing, and then you accidentally write a book about the history of elven shoes. You don't need that. Your players are not going to want to know. <laughs> so at its core, agile world building really is based on four principles. You can never know everything about your world. A world is too big. A world is, is massive and complex, but you don't need to know everything. You never will, and you don't need to. You will learn from what you've done, and you will build on that. Now, this slide says you'll learn from what you've done wrong. That is definitely true, but you'll also learn from what you've done right. And that is just as important. Learning what your players are engaged with and adding a little bit more, that's how you build an agile world that is working for your players. I forgot to change the slide. That's okay. <laughs> and speaking of that, you will learn from your players. Your players are going to tell you in their expressions, in their copious swearing, in their throwing dinks, drinks across the table, their spit takes, their, uh, their yawns. They're going to tell you what they're interested in and what they're not. And uh, tomorrow we're going to talk about player feedback, session zeros, all that good stuff to get more information from your players to make sure you're building a world that both of you enjoy, which gets us to point number three, four. I can count. You're doing this for you and your players. Everybody else be damned. You're here for you and your players. And that is what's import important. So, um, yeah, the big, I guess the question on everyone's lips. This all sounds great, right? What does this look like practically? Well, this is basically the agile world building cycle. At the start, you have the foundation and the seam. You do these only once. I just say this only once. No, no. Um, you do these only once. This is the setup of your world. And once you have these first principles, you can use them to build again and again. You can use them as touchstones, but you don't need to keep adding to them. They are there for you. They will give you references. It's everything you need to know. So once you've built your foundation, your seam, which we're going to be doing today, you then go into the agile cycle. That is play your session, learn from your players and from yourself, dream and design what comes next, and finally build only in paragraphs and sentences. Okay, paragraphs and sentences. I'm going to be saying that a lot today. Yep. Very, very important. So. In our foundation scene, now I've said all of that, good reading notes, blah, blah, blah. Um, we will talk more tomorrow about session zeros. We will talk about how this cycle looks in practice from session one and on. Today, we are going to be unpacking the foundation, how to start your world, which by the way, is our number one question on World Anvil. Oh my God, yes. How do I start building a world? Well, hopefully this will get you started all in sentences and paragraphs. So I think, that we start with the foundation. There it is. So there are a couple of questions I'm gonna throw out. And if you want to get these, then make sure that you are signed up to the newsletter because this is all in the homework assignment. We've included a link where you can see all of these questions and you'll be able to fill them in for yourself as well. Indeed. So scope is where we start. What is your motivation? As actors ask, so do world builders. Why are you building this world and what do you want out of it? This is more important than you think. This is not an exercise in self-realization. This is an exercise in making sure you're building something that you and your players will enjoy. If you're streaming, is it going to be engaging for your audience? If you are turning it into a podcast, is it going to be engaging for them? If you want to publish it, is it going to be popular with the zeitgeist? Or if it's just a home game, which is going to be for most of you, is this something that your players are going to be excited about? Is this something you still want to be doing in six months time? That, that is what you're answering when you're talking about your motivation. Next, what is your unique selling point, essentially? So I think the words unique selling point, hook, um, 
they can scare people and they don't have to. You do not have to invent the wheel. You do not have to come up with a complicated magic system. The unique part does not mean that everything has to be completely different. All it means is what do you tell your players to get them excited? Yeah, and also it has to do with what your players want. That is the unique. That's why we said in the beginning that it is about you and about your players, because your players are a bunch of murder hobos. What they really want is murder hobo killing material kind of thing. And that is the unique thing about your world. Like, you know, special murder hobo dying creatures kind of thing. Right, exactly. So if that's who your players are and that's their motivation, then that should be the USP of your world. If your players are all obsessed with the 18th century, do a campaign set in an 18th century style world. And that is your unique selling point and hook, right? I'll call Janet. Janet will tell you all about it. A little bit obsessed with the 18th century here. But, but we digress. Um, so this is a really, really important thing to establish. And again, you only need a sentence. You can see our example of the foundation document right there. We just have a sentence and that's it. Um, next, we talk about theme. So this is, it sounds terribly complicated, but actually it's very, very easy. And using comparisons are very useful for this. So what you see is just one example. We're not saying that all your worlds have to feel epic. We're not saying all your worlds should be dark. We're just showing you the example that we came up with for the campaign that we're all working on today. That is the adventure that you saw Guy building before and the map of Kaori started currently building as well. Absolutely. So how does your world feel according to the player experience? Oh, we've got questions of different order here. Yeah, um, okay. It doesn't find it. Yeah, right. absolutely. Um, this is this is sort of what it feels like to walk around your world. Skyrim doesn't feel like Witcher, which doesn't feel like Dark Souls, right? Mm -hmm. They have different tone. They have different player agency. They feel different and you do different things. What is the genre of your world? Now, genre is a very wibbly wobbly, timey wimey thing, but establishing a little bit is it fantasy or sci-fi for example am i going to have steampunk elements or am i going to go straight medieval fantasy this is very useful so that people don't get like genre whiplash if you're in middle earth and the the aliens invade your players are going to have a bad time they're not going to know what's going on and you're going to um you're going to give them this genre whiplash basically you break the suspension of disbelief which is is what we want to avoid so one sentence, what is the genre? One sentence, what is the, uh, the player feel? What is the tone of your world? So in tone, we talk about bright and dark, right? Does the, is the world a lovely place to live? Is it bright and beautiful? Is it a utopia? Or is it a really awful place? So the two examples I like to use for this are The Princess Bride on Bright and uh, Warhammer 40K or uh, Dark Souls, both very dark worlds. They are horrible places to live. That's, that's what we're talking about. So is it, like, where does it land on that scale? Because if you have a very dark world and you start introducing um, rainbow unicorns and that it's going to feel very weird and your players are going to get very put off by well, it. Several people ask you what kind of templates you should use for this. Mm. Uh, the answer is generic template for now. For now. But everything we're telling you right now is part of an update that will be coming in Gold Dumble, which is going to be called the Gold Dumble Meta. Yeah. And it will be based on this talk and what we're showing you right now. Yeah. So everything you see now, they will have its own place and will done with that will be able to put it but for now put it in the genetic article yeah absolutely and uh, again we've been working with our professor of world building and all sorts of other people to make sure that this is really what it should be so when we now that we have this refined that's going to be going up soon and Indeed, you'll be able yeah. to put this all in a meta section um and uh, finally recurring themes can you scroll down a little bit oh. Of course, here you are. I have a note there about character agency, which I didn't mention. Now, character agency is um, relatively important for game masters. It's incredibly important for novelists, but it's relatively important for game masters. It's understanding how much impact your player is going to have on the world. Now, in general, as game masters, we want to give our players a lot of agency. We want them to feel like they are changing the world because that's what keeps them engaged, right? So in general, you should aim for a relatively high um, player agency but if you're playing a cyberpunk game part of the genre is one man finds it very hard to change the world right it's well, like one man against the corporation that's part of the cyberpunk in a genre. way it's kind of like creeping away the agency right exactly yeah. so be careful taking your character agency away too much but you can see from the example there and we've given you anvil advice in the section uh figuring out how much effort it takes to change the world and how long that change lasts is also an important part of the tone of your world so again, one sentence is plenty on this, just establishing where you're at when you build your world. And uh, 
Next is recurring themes. Can you go down for me? Yeah. There we go. So recurring themes essentially just give you some points where you can really support that genre, tone, mood, everything else. You can see here we've we've picked a few sort of graphic ones. You can pick music as themes as well, imagery, anything like this, just to, to make sure that even if the adventure, like one week you're having a more funny adventure, you still have these themes because they bring you back to that genre and that tone. Even if one week you're having a funny one, one week you're having a serious one. Yeah, but always you should keep essentially a semblance of connectivity and uh, essentially, if I call that, uh, being in one place. Right, it's that, it's that continuity, continuity essentially. Continuity, exactly, that's the whole Absolutely. Point. Yeah, and that, that would be a very good idea because I think you've said it already, but don't forget guys, you will have to come back to that again and again while you're writing your world and your articles because that will be your way to sense check your world and make sure that you're still staying where you're supposed to be. Absolutely. So um, let's hop on to the next slide for our meta because this is some important juju. There is, as we've said, not a possibility that you will know everything going on in your world. A world is too big, you do not need to. Now, to paraphrase Brandon Sanderson, if you drill down in a couple of areas, a couple of aspects of your world in detail, it's going to make the whole thing feel detailed, but you're not unpacking everything. So if you pick three of these, now these are taken from Dr. Trent Hergenrader's book, Collaborative World Building, and unpack those as you build the world in a little bit more detail, again, one sentence and one paragraph is plenty, then that's going to make your world feel much more detailed. It's going to make it feel like there's a lot going on without you completely disappearing down the rabbit warren and building out everything and losing a bunch of time. We don't want that. Remember, if something becomes important later, you can always build it out. So that is the meta section. Now, the final section of the foundation. Now, remember, we've been talking a bit, but this is for you. This is just a sentence and a paragraph. That is all. Finally, we go to the drama of your world. Now, this is where we start to get more into specifics. We have established why you're building the world and what's that hook. We've established a little bit the theme and the genre and the tone, so we know what the world feels like. We've established some aspects of the world that are going to be important for your story and your campaign. And now we're talking about conflicts, drama. This is the stuff that sets the world in motion and makes it feel alive. <laughs> So these don't have to be bad, they can be good as well. And ideally you'll have a mix, depending on the tone of your world. If your world's super dark, they'll generally be quite crappy, most of them. If your world is brighter, you can expect to see brighter and dr darker drama focuses mixed in together. And this is like the big picture stuff that's going on. Yeah, it's not about necessarily what is wrong with the world, it's what is going on with the world. That is the question, which are the forces that motivate currently storytelling in your world? That is the question there. Absolutely. So some examples might be that there's a plague going on, there's an invading entity, like the demons or invaders from another country or whatever. Aliens. Or aliens, exactly. Or there's a cold war going on. So there's growing hostilities, wealth disparity might be a problem, um, a rise in drug abuse or a new drug on the streets that has caused impact. Um, limitless much? Limitless much, exactly. Um, you might be in an age of technology where there are all these new inventions coming out every, every week, every year. Something new comes out and everybody's talking about it all the time. Um, you might have had lands that have just been discovered, a new continent, a new island, a new miracle drug. <laughs> that was very nice. Thank you. I for didn't that. See. that was beautiful. I um, was going on Aladdin there, but yeah. <laughs> so, in general, five points of drama are a good number. Little trick, three is manageable for your players to, to track. Five feels like lots. Yeah. So it's it's a cheap trick, but it works. So it's not a cheap trick, if you see what I mean. Um, adding five of these points, and I would say only use two or three of them in your main plot so that the others really are just background stuff that is happening. And uh, again, we're gonna talk tomorrow about linking these into minor plots, subplots, conversations, all that stuff. Um, character backgrounds, there's mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff you can do with this. Um, and it makes your world feel really integrated and really busy with five sentences. Five sentences, people, and you've just created the background movement of your world. It is Indeed. really not that complicated. That's what we're aiming for. So we have the foundation. That's literally it. You pick your motivation, you write a little bit about the theme, you 
choose some areas to drill down in. You don't have to drill down in them yet. You literally, a sentence is enough. And you create some drama, five sentences on your drama. And your foundation is done. Congratulations, you almost have a world. Let's set the scene. So setting the scene, again, we are building in sentences and paragraphs. Do not write the Silmarillion at this point. It's only going to confuse you. It's only going to confuse your players. It's going to waste your time. We don't want that. We want you to be playing. You are game masters. So start with the rules of the world. This is the big stuff that makes your world different from Earth. Is there magic? Are there psionics? Is the gravity different? Are there aliens? Are there different races? This is important to know. And uh, the big geography, all that stuff is very, very important. Uh, sorry, not races. Ignore the thing I said about races. That's nonsense. We'll talk about that later. Um, yes. Big geography is what we're talking about. This stuff has fundamental repercussions on your world. If there are monsters in the dreams of people and those monsters are real, you need to know now. If there are parallel dimensions that are bleeding into your world, you need to know now if they're going to be an important part of your world. Next, we talk about cosmology. Again, no Silmarillion. You can see we have one sentence here about cosmology. One sentence. How did the world come to be? If you don't know how the world came to be as a game master or you don't want to lock yourself into something right now, choose an idea about how the world came to be from a culture or a dominant religion in your world. I think something important to state here as well, just to remind everybody, these information are not for your players. Absolutely not. These are for you. So if your players do not know the reality about the cosmology and you do, you should write the reality here because that will change the way that people perceive how the reality really is. Like we might know, for example, that in this world there are two gods, but because this god appear, for example, as like 15 different shapes, the humans of this world and the creatures of this world perceive them as 15 gods, for, exactly. for example. Exactly. So don't worry too much about player perception right now. What you're nailing down is, reality. is is your reality as a game master. So it can be rough. You can have spelling mistakes. That doesn't matter. You just need to get it down. Uh, next, we think about some of the specifics of your geography. And again, we're talking in big terms. So for example, if you're making a world that is just seas, write that here. If you're making a world that is flying islands, write that here. If you're making a world that is primordial, it's got like, um, I don't know, lava flows and giant animals and uh, like jagged mountains, write that here as well. This is the general picture of the geography of your world. Don't get specific, one sentence people. And then any special features. So some examples I have here are for example, Game of Thrones, where you have those, like a summer can last years and a winter can last decades, right? It's, it's a fundamental quirk of your geography. If you have a binary star, write that down. That's going to change. It's not necessarily going to change much, but it's going to change what people see when they look up, for example, right? Um, anyone familiar with the Dragon Riders of Pern series by Anne McCaffrey? Uh, the moon that throws spores onto the earth and those spores destroy stuff. That's another sort of big fundamental special property of geography. Yeah, because that kind of stuff should be as in the there. moon comes closer, that's what triggers a sport to fall to the earth. Exactly. Right? Yeah. And that's that's why it's a geography, right? Um, but that's stuff that changes the nature of life in your world. So deciding that now is really going to help you for the next section. And finally, and this is again, game master specific initial building size. So you are not necessarily going to build out your whole world. You don't necessarily need to do that. Pick the initial size of your building. If your campaign takes place on an island or on a continent or on a region, if you're playing a space campaign, choose sort of, is it, is it going to be a solar system? Is it going to be a galaxy? And that's going to help you understand which sort of, which, how many specific points you're building of world building and also where the line is, right? That doesn't mean that your players can't leave. That just means that you'll, you have a starting point and then you can add a soft break. Mm -hmm. So by soft break, for example, if you're on an island, maybe ocean going ships only come by once a month. If you're in a dystopian waste town, maybe you need equipment to cross the wasteland and you need to buy or build or steal that equipment so that you can get out. This is really, really important because it's giving you that first area that you can build in detail and it gives you a soft break so you can see when your players are getting close to the edge, right? It yeah. doesn't mean that you don't build outside the edge eventually. It doesn't mean that you keep them in there. It just gives you an understanding of where they are and what, you know, on, on, on their way out. 
Before we continue, I would Please. like to say something because I've seen a lot of questions coming on that. Fantastic. First of all, um, I would like to say to everybody that all of this information will be given to you. These articles will be sent to you with the, the work, uh, the, yeah, the homework. The homework. Yeah. Yes, and we know that this talk is very, very condensed. condensed. Trust me, we sat down with Janet for two days and we have to remove so much things from our original content. We know very well right now that at this point, this should become a book. And it will become a book. We've been asked to write it into a book. We're, exactly. we're not quite there yet, and we will. It's just time. But as Janet said in the beginning, we are doing this by continuously upgrading it and making it better and putting these talks out in the air to conventions, things like that. Yeah. And we learn from this as we, as you could do as well with the cycle of world building. And we are becoming better at this. And at some point, we will actually be uh, getting this out. So do not yeah. worry. And you will get these notes, all of them, at the end of the whole thing. Yeah, lots of hype, by the way, in the chat for um, a book on this. Yes, it will come, I promise you folks. Um, so we have built the geography in broad strokes. That's all you need right now. And uh, now it's time to talk a little bit about people. Now, people is a place that world builders get lost because people are inherently fascinating and cultures are inherently fascinating. But again, we are building into sentences and paragraphs. You, what you're seeing here on the screen right now, that whole slide, that's everything we know about people by the end of setting the scene. And that is plenty. There is so much stuff in there. Oh my God, yes. So who used to live here and what's their history? We decided with this example that we do one edge of the old world and one edge of the new world because we're doing an exploration campaign. Mm -hmm. So we were like, let's build a little bit of the old continent and a little bit of the new continent that they're going to be exploring. It's like building the Britain and Portugal and a bit of France and then the West America, side, the, Amer the, the side of the Americas. Yeah. Right, exactly. Um, so that's what we decided we need to build. So you can see, again, even though we're building sections on two continents, literally we have one sentence, sorry, two sentences about the new world. Uh, there was an advanced empire and then some stuff happened and this is what they left behind. And then in the old world, we wrote again two sentences. The world used to be underwater and this is what's left behind because it used to be underwater. Yes. So but with those with those four sentences, which are, by the way, very short sentences, we've just created huge amounts of possibility without creating huge amounts of text. And that's what the, that's the game here. To go back to what Kyora is doing right now, Kyora is building a map that will be very much inspired from this because she will have to put like the underwater monster mm -hmm. uh, bones there and seaweed like uh, uh, trees there because this used to be underwater. So it would be developed in a completely different way than what you'd expect from something like that. Exactly, exactly. Um, and you can see, we wrote, the land is littered with the bones of gargantuan dead sea creatures, abandoned merfolk cities, and calcified coral forests. That's three random items that we've imagined as writing the sentence that creates a world of possibilities. And that's what this section is all about. You're building the possibilities. You're not building the details. Um, then you write about what species live here now, this is the present moment, and what's their history. Again, a little bit more about this. Um, again, we've written, what, two sentences. The old world is peopled by five human uh, empires. And then we write a little bit of detail, like literally a couple of fragments about each empire. And then we wrote about the new world. And again, we wrote two sentences. Sentient rack folk who believe that the binary sun is a two-headed snake that requires sacrifices. <laughs> exactly. A again, like that's very evocative, but it doesn't give you a lot of detail and you don't need it now. The detail is for later adding what these people who live now need from each other is very important because all of a sudden you're setting those people in motion. This is just like the, the drama section that we talked about before. You're giving your world direction, you're giving your world life simply by adding motivation. That's all you're doing here. You're saying what does A need from B and what does B need from A? Um, and honestly, that's, that's it. That's how you set the scene that's how you build the foundation of your world. I have talked for half an hour and explained all of those, but at its at its base, I think it's what it would be twelve sentences. I think pretty much pretty yeah. much twelve sentences, and all of a sudden you have a spectacular world. You have people. You have geographic laws. You have your magic. You have your drama. It's all there, and it hasn't taken you more than half an hour, and that's what we're after, right? Because we are all about the game. So, as we come into part two of this talk, at this point, you would write up a small amount about your world and go for session zero. 
But we can't send you off to your players now because you're hanging out with us, which is awesome. So um, tomorrow we'll be talking about implementing this cycle of play, think, design, build. This agile cycle that's going to take you through every session and help you build only what you need, only when you need it. And uh, we're going to show you what a player primer looks like. And uh, basically, we're going to tell you what to do when your players go completely off piste, which, my God, they will sometimes. It's Interesting okay. question. It was yeah. just asked what was happens. It? Yes. And yes, we'll be responding to that tomorrow because we we know the issue. We know how to fix it. I've been a player. I know players do weird stuff. Yep. I do it all the time. I was a storyteller. <laughs> I know how. So we'll be talking about what to do when your players do something that you don't expect. And uh, again, with this agile world building, not building a ton of stuff, it's actually very easy to adapt, right? So that's what we're going to be talking about as well. And what to learn from your players when they do stuff like that, because that's Indeed. equally important. But for now, we're going to show you a little bit about what this agile world building looks like as world building. So we've, we've built the foundation of our world. We've shown you what that looks like. We've shown you the scene setting. Um, and again, we've shown you literally it's a one page document. It is no more. And from there, we built this world around Guy's adventure, right? And we're going to show you a little bit what we've done, literally sentences and paragraphs to build out this world so that your players can play there. Take us in. Ta -da! So this is the world of Astria. We have built it together. How long did it take us? Like three hours? Less than that. Less than that, exactly. So we would like to show you pretty much what we're working on at this point. Uh, I think that we want to discuss first, in fact, the codex of the world. Yeah, right? so again, one of the questions we get asked a lot is how do I organize my world? And this is what we wanted to show you here very, very quickly. These are categories and articles. Those of you who aren't familiar with World Anvil, go make an account. It's free, by the way. Um, uh, you create categories, you put your articles in categories, and they show up on your world codex. It's that simple. Exactly. And I wanted to show a little bit of guys how we design it to make it accessible to everyone. So first of all, for, at this point, on purpose, everything in this world is public because yes. we want you to see it. But I will explain to you which of those would have been public and which of those would have not been public. So we have a, a folder here called the world, and within there we have the Bellinger Bay, which is the extended area that right now Kyora is building, and then we have Bellinger Bay Landing, which is the village, which is going to be in Bellinger Bay, and we'll show you very soon. In the village, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven areas, actually six areas of interest and one character, because yeah. that was important. And then we have one, two, three, four, five, six areas that are in fact important in the, gener in, in the generic area. Exactly. And that is what your players will know about the world. This is pretty much what they will be able to see. All so, of those articles are sentences and paragraphs. Yeah, we'll show you very soon. We'll show you the, more. Yeah, we'll show you very soon. Then we have the powers of the world. We have the Wind Riders of Azria, which is kind of like the um, uh, the faction that the players are part of, which is effectively a kind of like a a, a, a navy for hire, if right, you wish, exactly. kind of thing. And then we have uh, the WV Donager, which is the airship that Gaior, uh, Gaior that crashes. You, yeah. that crashes, exactly. And then we have the meta, which is the So these are the articles. things that you've already seen, right? Exactly. The foundation and setting the scene. And uh, to answer that question, we'll be giving you the links of those afterwards so you can yes. look at them yourselves. We didn't want to give them to you now because otherwise you'll read those and you'll miss the talk. The talk, the talk is important. We tell you how to do the thing. Exactly. So these are the foundation and setting the scene articles that you've seen before. Yeah. And of course, you understand this category would have been hidden from the players. Exactly. So they don't see the meta stuff. That's exactly. just for you. The other thing that we hit from the players is session zero notes or yep. any other session notes you might have. There are so many ways of actually making taking notes in Goldamu. You can use the notebook, you can use articles to take notes during your sessions, or as Janet uh, is actually you're using the notes, right? The note system. I use either notes. I use notes a lot as my player yeah. um, thing. I tend to use the stream. So the we stream. have a, a digital game master stream where you can sort of create NPCs in five seconds and write a stream of consciousness of your notes and then turn that into a session report later because it's all all there for you. Exactly. And I tend to write that because I write stuff in, in very like bitty notes. And then what we have here is in fact the adventure, the article that Guy would have written. Yeah, exactly. Which so is the, in plot. Fact the plot, exactly. And of course, you understand this, this, and this would have been completely hidden from your players. And your players will only have access to these parts of these articles. Right. They only see the world building. Exactly. And they only see the bits of that world building you want to show them. And we'll go more into that in a minute as well. Excellent. But let's show them the map. Of course. We'll show you one of the two maps. This is the map again from Kyora. This is the village that, uh, that will be in Kyora's map. This is the village of Bellinger Landing. Yeah. And what we've done here 
essentially that we want to show you just put the look and from my notes there we go is we have created articles either if it's something where that's important with one allowed one sentence and one paragraph maximum or if they're not that important we've yes. literally not added an article at all we've just added a pop-up a little text in the pop-up and that's enough that is more than enough like in the stables that we knew that there would be nothing necessarily important at this point when it becomes right exactly and if the if the players ask thousands of questions about the stables and get really obsessed with it well you go away again this is this is the agile world building cycle you go away and add one paragraph and you just see what happens. So Janet here put a little bit of uh, an, allowed. an allowed, effectively something that you'll be uh, narrating to your players while you're playing, or the players can actually read themselves to get the idea of what's happening there Absolutely. during the articles. And here, because this is the wreck of the airship, we didn't add a sentence or paragraph. We can make assumptions about that. They, the players won't want to know a ton of detail about it, but we added an allowed to set the scene and make it very clear it's going nowhere. That's the end of the allowed. That's the crucial bit. Indeed. They're not going anywhere. They need to engage with the area that they're in. On the other hand, when it comes to the ship and wolf inn, that we had a little bit more information. We know that there will be action happening there. We know that there'll be uh, interactions. We know that they will stay there, right? So they're going to be spending time there. So, so what we've been, sorry. You can do, you can do. So uh, what I've included here is an allowed. Again, this is a little bit of flavor text. Uh, going back to Guy's theme, it's a dark world. You want them to feel like something is a little bit wrong with this village, although everything on the surface is super nice. So when you go in, there's a single fiddle playing in the corner. As you open the door, the door is slanted. Everything in the wolf and sheep is lopsided. Um, it's just to show the theme a little bit, actually, to that. Exactly, yeah. just to give that taste of the theme. But the guy seems nice, and the bear is cheap, and the beds are cheap. And what I've done is I've also created very, very quickly. Again, this took me, what, two minutes, I think, to create a list of things that they can pay for. And in that list, I've included Ogre's Wake, which links into the name of the bridge, which is called um, yeah. Ogre's Rest. Ogre's. I've included Bellinger's Chest, which links into a local legend. Again, I created one sentence about a local legend, and uh, that links into that. So if people ask more details, that's a gateway to uh, giving them a little bit more. Again, Glass Shaker's Health, Glass Shaker is the name of the alchemist. There's a little story behind that as well. He adds a secret ingredient to the whiskey and it tastes really great. And we all know what that secret ingredient might be if we've watched Guy's stream. Indeed. So this is the it's point. Brilliant. This is the idea. With very, very little actual world building, you're adding a ton of hooks and suggestion and foreshadowing, right? It's literally, it's evocative. And you as a game master, you don't need to create everything up front. You can improvise that. You can build that when the players are interested, mark down those seeds and develop them later. And that's also what we're going to be talking about tomorrow. And the same thing happened here when it comes to the uh, Emerald Knox, which is the location that Dr. Theodore Glassshaker, the uh, alchemist, was talking about. Exactly. Lives. And Janet gives a bit more detail here in the article as well. And also, um, uh, we have a bit of a map here as well, in case that something takes action, in fact. Right, exactly. And uh, it's something that players always like, oh, what does it look like? What does it look like? They're always asking this. You can give them the link to the article. Again, there's nothing in here that they shouldn't know. If You can put secret GM's notes if you want to. Can you zoom out on the, uh, the map in the sidebar? So the little Kaora map, we just wanted to include this because it's awesome. So yeah, and here you can see we have the first floor and the second floor of the alchemists, just to give them a taste of what it is. Again, it takes, what, two minutes to upload a map on World Anvil. It's not about spending huge amounts of time developing areas. It's about developing things that have a lot of flavor and give you that evocative space to jump off. Indeed. But sometimes you want to create something in a little bit more detail. Indeed. So all of these areas, there's not big encounters going on here. You. They're going to be, be interaction, but there's no actually. There's going to be encounter. social encounters, but it's not going to be a space that they're spending huge amounts of time in, uh, neither in game time or at table time. On the other hand, the forest is somewhere that they will be spending a bunch of time. So we did a little bit more detail on this. This is the shade forest. Again, following Guy's uh, mood, we decided, okay, well let's let's make it a mushroom forest because it's really like creepy. We've included an allowed, which is full of things like, oh, the forest is spreading, the grass around it is dead, the air is thick with spores as you breathe it in, <laughs> and uh, it's dark and creepy, basically. Again, we've included on the right hand side, you can see I just added a, a soundtrack, so a little bit of ambience. There's two sentences and then nothing as far as the players are concerned because after that top section yeah, the players can't see anything 
but that is because this is a secret, yeah. which will only be known by players that are elves or spellcasters. Exactly. So we wanted to include something that, okay, if you're an elf or if you're a spellcaster, you might know a bit more about these mushrooms. So we've included that. Yeah. And if you have given yourself the elf subscriber group or the um, spellcaster subscriber group, which you can do very easily with a click box, then um, you'll be able to see that secret, but nobody else will. So that includes nice was, party interaction. The whole point was exactly that uh, by doing that, the players will in fact have something nobody else knows about, exactly. which is adding so much to that because it's so awkward when you have to say, oh, by the way, Dimitris, you know about this thing. But and then nobody he turns, else knows, yeah. And then he turns to others and said, oh, by the way, this is the thing. And it's like, it sounds so repetitive As and useless. As a player, it feels weird or awkward. And then you're left with the question, oh, do I role play that? Or do I just say, I tell them that. Yeah. And you're like, wah, wah. but by doing that, they know it. Nobody else does. And when they see it, they're like, oh, by the way, guys, did you know that? You know what I mean? It, it's very interesting. Absolutely. And we have some information here just for the storyteller as well. Yeah, we gave, again, we gave uh, uh, just, again, that's, that's one sentence of history where the forest came from. Because these don't, things don't spring out from nowhere. It's a mushroom forest. It's a bit weird. So we gave information about that. And then the rest of this is just GM's notes. So we added in the environment, we've added um, a little bit of difficulty. Uh, we added dice rolls. Again, whatever system you're using, that's easy. You just, you give your players, the longer they stay there, a little bit of fatigue. We added the encounter. So we included basically some information about the husks, a DC 20 survival check. Again, you can make whatever system you like um, to help people know if they're there or not. And um, then we added the stat block from the husks. So as a GM, you can just like roll them up and do your thing. Um, and again, finally, a little bit of detail about the flora and fauna. Which is in fact visible to the rest of the That bit's visible again. So exactly. players will see that bit on the top and that bit on the bottom. And as a GM, you see everything else. And that's basically, and again, like putting this together, I think this whole article took me 15 minutes to put together. Indeed. Literally no longer. And this is this is like one of the stars of the campaign. This is one of the things that I really dug into. You saw okay, everything the else. Exactly, sorry. Uh, and again, it's one of the things that really goes back to that um, that uh, foundation and that setting the scene stuff. We wanted to really dig into that because that's setting out the whole campaign. So that's pretty much it. I think we better tell you what we want you to do, haven't we? What is it time for? It is. So folks, when you are signed up to the newsletter at circleofworldbuilders.com, you will receive your homework and you'll be able to submit that via the form that we will be sending you. The homework is this, build your foundation for your world in sentences and paragraphs. We'll be sending you the link for that article that we made, so you can use that as a uh, version. Uh, create it in a generic article template on World Anvil. Again, you can just copy those headers and put them in and write in your own sentences. Do the same with the set the scene article. Again, sentences and paragraphs, mainly sentences, in fact. And uh, yeah, keep it brief. This is all about creating evocative, ideas, spaces, feelings, not about creating lots of elven shoes, lots of tiny details, all right? We're not, we're not doing elven shoes now. And finally, after you've done that, which should take you about 15 minutes, create one location based on your foundation and scene. We want this to be something that really epitomizes your foundation your and your scene, something that really captures the tone, the feeling of your world and this is something that's a great thing to use in your session one. And that's what we're going to be looking at tomorrow. We're going to be looking at your foundation, your scene, how what you've put in your world, and then how you've built that into really the epitome of your world to use in session one to introduce your players into your world in a very epic way, because to, that's what we're talking just about. Just to clarify, we are asking you to create a new world, if that's possible, and then write the foundation and the scene for that world, and then write a location in that world. I would say it doesn't have to be it does, no it does not have to be but if they do not know how to start and they they feel weird actually starting from the beginning you can actually do that if not Absolutely. of course work on your world and also to give you an example of the location for example if you're building cyberpunk it better be raining and it better be neon lines there right exactly we're talking about stuff that really epitomizes your foundation your tone all that good stuff well we have a very short amount of time for questions um, folks, as we say, we'll be making this into a book. And if you have more questions, you can drop into our streams. We go live, what, five times a week on Twitch and YouTube. We're forward slash World Anvil everywhere. But let's hop into some questions. Let's see what we have. Let's see what we have. 
the questions have not been copied across. Folks, if you want to ask questions, capital letters question would be the way to do that. In the meantime, it's one from Surian. Sometimes ideas like subterranean fungal forest occur independently to multiple creators. Do you have any tips on how to make your version unique? Uh, your answer it or shall I answer it? Uh, I can give my answer and you, you can give your yeah, answer. Yeah. Um, I would say that uh, make sure that you're really digging into what is characteristic, the USP of your world. What is characteristic about your world? How's that gonna change things? Um, because if psionics are a thing, you can have a mushroom forest where the mushrooms are psionic. You know, if your world, if, if the crucial thing about your world is that it's binary, you can have, it, sorry, that it has binary star, yeah. the, you can have mushroom forests that react when you get a solar eclipse from one star to the other, right? Dig into the USP of your world, dig into the original things in your world, and you could convert the most standard trope into something that feels completely new and refreshed. Yes, that's a very good point. It's a very, very good point indeed. Uh, Chris, uh, uh, sorry, Iris Mercury says a question. Will you be able to connect with the other homework? Yes, that's the whole point. The uh, items that you bring with your homework are meant to be connected into building one single thing. Yes. Uh, you say something? No. Nope. Okay. Oh, no, nope. good. Uh, we have another question. Does Zanar inform foundation or does foundation inform Zanar? That's a very good question. That is a great question. It kind of depends on what you want. Um, and I would say, again, genre is a very flexible thing. You know, fantasy is such a big space, for example. Yeah. Urban fantasy, if you take a subgenre of fantasy, is also a massively flexible space. So genre is really just a set of expectations. I would say that, yeah, I completely agree with you, but I would say that uh, in many ways, genres we discussed already is part of your foundation. It will definitely affect it but it can be a starting stone. Essentially, think about that. If your genre, for example, is post-apocalyptic or something like uh, cyberpunk, of course there are some tropes and some bases that you will be gathering from your genre, but that does not mean you start there because this is what the foundation is all about. It's about you putting your personal touches and making it unique and making it your own. If, for example, your, I'll give you an example. Cyberpunk is both Judge Dredd, arguably, and uh, also, um, uh, totally cool, can be, can be considered yeah. al almost cyberpunk, but also you can also have things like well, Blade I would, Runner. I would argue example. that the recent Picard was had a lot of cyberpunk influence, yes, for indeed. example. And they look very different. The reason for that is because they have uh, focused in different locations in the world, like Picard becomes very militaristic and it becomes like, sort of about uh, global locations, while Blade Runner is actually d down dirty about Personal Technology, relations, personal freedoms, exactly. that kind of stuff. So they do you remember that big slide where we talked about the meta? They've dug into different parts of the meta and they have a different USP. Exactly. And therefore, the genre is expressed in a totally different way. And that's why we want you to write these sentences because that's what's going to make your world feel so unique. It's stacking these things one on top of the other so you don't end up with another medieval fantasy, generic, hokey cokey elves and dwarves world. You end up with something with a unique flavor that your players will enjoy that will be really well fitting for you. I think we have time for one more question. Just one. We'll answer that one last. Okay. Is there a way to make part of maps visible as well as text? Yes, yes. absolutely, Lewis. Yes. Um, so you can make map pins, map layers, groups of map pins. All of these can be visible or not visible. If you go to our YouTube and check out our map, tutorials you will see everything that's possible 20 minutes of your life and you'll know everything there is to know about interactive maps on world anvil and final the final question where did our maps come from from this tutorial today this uh, lecture today these are all maps of kaora yes kaora who's currently badly drawing a map on over on his channel who's going to be with cows uh cows and wild, gone wild with us later they're all kaora maps so I think we have to go. I think I hear the voice of God in my ear. We have to go. We have to go. Folks, thank you so much for listening. This was a whistle stop tour of agile world building, just the foundation. And tomorrow we're going to be teaching you about session zeros, primers, getting your players involved, and even more about world building uh, when your players go off in a weird direction and uh, world building without world builders disease. Thank you very much, guys. See bye you bye. later. Bye.